All right. I have my notes here. So I've got my notes on. Uh, again, thank you, John, and uh, everyone for um, offering me this time to speak to you today. I I'm sure a lot of what I'm going to have to say today is going to come to uh, as no news to most of you. I'm going to try to make it a little more personal then and, and give a little bit more of my reflections. You know, as um, North America's only totally blind professional angler, conservationist, author, blogger, a podcaster, I make some films, do some documentaries. I love making films as a blind person, go figure. And uh, I do some TV stuff too, right? Uh, and it's all about conservation. I decided a long time ago that, you know, catching fish, catching many fish, catching big fish, I, I can do it and I'm not bad at it, but I don't want to just do that, like fishing tournaments. I used to fish 20 tournaments a year at least, and I managed to ratchet that back to maybe five or 10 a year now, and most of that's for charity. And, and instead, I, I, I try to take my visualization skills as a blind person. You know, I, I get out of bed every morning and I visualize my world, right? Like starting with where are my socks and my slippers, you know, where did I leave them? And, and then just try to visualize what's going on outside my, my room, my house, my community, you know, the rivers, the arteries, the lakes and all of that. And then underwater visualization as well. And we'll get into a little bit more about that, you know, with through scuba and just through my fishing line. I mean, my fishing line and my fishing rod, it's like I've extended my white cane hundreds of feet. You know, my fishing rod is my white cane. If you think about it, a fishing rod, 99% of the time we're using it as anglers, as sensing sticks, right? It's our, it's our way of sensing what's down there, just like a blind person. Only this one's got a fishing reel on it and fishing line that extends the reach of that, that fishing rod down beneath the waves and tells us who are the fish, how are they biting? Where are they living? Is it weeds? Is it rocks? Is it gravel? Is it mud down there? Is there nothing down there? You know, we learn all that just by feeling our fishing rod. I think I love listening to anglers talk about how it feels, you know, and what they were feeling when they caught that fish or before they caught that fish. And, you know, I, I write my own articles about feel the bite. But like I said, I really think the way I can contribute and give back is to talk about the importance of visualizing what's taking place beneath the surface, because that's really so important. You know, for way too long, we thought out of sight, out of mind, whoosh, into the river it goes, disappears, no problem. And that may have been the case for thousands and thousands of years when the only thing we had to throw away was all organic material. So, you know, tossing it into the river and letting uh, nature take its course probably wasn't a big problem. But the things we've been throwing out more recently is uh, non-organics. You know, we've got so many things that we shouldn't have been throwing in the river, still imagining that they're going to disappear. Well, they haven't been. So um, starting off with that sour note, let's, uh, let's uh, move on to the presentation. So we'll go to the uh, second slide here, if you don't mind. Uh, what slide are we on now? We are on impacts on Indigenous communities. Yeah, so here's a picture of me uh, on board my boat with a Mohawk elder, Norman Peters, and he was showing me some of the experiences they have on the uh, upper St. Lawrence River below the Saunders Dam there in Lake St. Francis, and then we're holding a smallmouth bass, and it's got a, we're showing, he's showing me the wound of a lamprey on the side of that bass. That's a, that's a very visual evidence of, of invasive species, but but, you know, the, the, the relationship between the Mohawk people and the river, and these are people of the river, right? These are people who lived on the river for tens of thousands of years, and their, their world is the river, the food, the transportation. It was all about the river. And then we came along and, you know, we implemented all sorts of industry and construction and development and toxins, and we broke their relationship. You know, we told them, don't eat the fish. It's not safe anymore. And so, 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 so much for their ceremonial food, so much for their food and their commerce, their trade, all of that they had to turn their backs on. And, uh, and I, I, I'm invited to go to the Aquasassini Watershed World Celebrations. And I was handing out uh, fish ID cards and things like that to a lot of the youth, the Mohawk youth, and asking them, you know, when did you catch your last fish or what do you like to fish for? 
And I was, I'm saddened by how many of the, the new generation of Mohawk youth that haven't had that experience have been denied that fundamental experience that's so vital to their culture and all our cultures, all of us really have to spend time by the water and connect with nature through fish. And that, that's been interrupted. Let's hope it's interrupted and it's not a permanent thing. So we'll go to the next slide. Here's a picture of a big freighter. So, you know, heavy industry and opening up the seaway, there were two massive changes to the uh, St. Lawrence that we implemented. And now we're seeing the uh, results of that, right? I mean, 185 invasive species into the Great Lakes, uh, areas of concern, you know, it, industry leaving this behind and that's a common story we see all across canada with abandoned oil wells and uranium mines in northern uh, saskatchewan and oil wells in alberta you know we see industry quite often you know folds its tent leaves and then we are left with the mess to clean up and you know you whether it's the industry's fault or governance fault or our fault for, for just wanting those great jobs i don't think finger pointing is is the answer here. I think it's, we just need to learn how to do it better. You know, and in the meantime, we have these messes to clean up. And thankfully, you know, your First Nations communities there it, along the St. Lawrence River got together with a bunch of organizations and government, the EPA, and managed to get some money to do some uh, cleaning up of these areas of concern. And I just, uh, you know, taking part in these Great Lakes um, Commission meetings, <clears throat> And the Great Lakes uh, Committee over the last November, you know, and we think the pandemic is all bad, but I'll tell you one thing, it's opened up all of these meetings for these Great Lakes this and Great Lakes that. And there's so many GL names right on it, just about every po possible political and scientific and bureaucratic organization. And it was all, the doors were thrown open. Thank you, Zoom. Thank you, Teams. You know, we all got to participate in those meetings and we didn't have to fly and stay in expensive hotels and eat in restaurants, which is really beyond the possibility of so many NGOs. But the transparency that took place in 2020 because of the pandemic, there's one little silver lining to this big dark cloud. But, you know, there's so much money and so much effort being spent on this and I, I you know I listened to these scientific reports on how they spent the money and the and the politicians lining up to take credit and I and Henry uh, Lickers the first um, IJC commissioner speaks up and with a little chat box and says hey how about the local indigenous knowledge and indigenous input on all this you know I hope that's going to be in these reports as well and I'm thinking yeah what about all the thousands of volunteer hours from groups like save the river you know with the shoreline cleanups where's that in these reports you know where's all the volunteer horsepower all the people act and action and effort that's been leveraged through this money and through these activities, that needs to be reported as well. And not just the scientific facts and the measurements and, and, and the financial statements of where the money went. I think the money is well spent, but what it leverages in terms of goodwill and effort from the communities and understanding needs to be included. A more holistic kind of reporting needs to take place. Um, next slide, please. transformative invasive species so here's my favorite invasive species the common carp you know some people hate them some people ride around in boats and shoot them with arrows and think that's fun and then you have the english coming over here and spending thousands and thousands of dollars to catch them on very special hooks using even more expensive equipment putting little neosporin on the hook wounds and massaging the fish and you know giving a mouth to mouth resuscitation almost god forbid that one should ever die in their hands and they love these fish these fish were brought over to North America over a hundred years ago because they were a, a, a comfort food, right? For many immigrant populations, common carp, gefilte fish, you name it. I mean, these are big fish. Well, you know, they've just been taken off the list of fish that you shouldn't eat because of toxicity. We'll see how many people start to eat these fish in, in, in North America. I uh, haven't seen much evidence of that yet, except for some still, you know, immigrant communities that still harvest these fish. I, I think it's a missed opportunity. I mean, some of these fish, these schools of these fish in the St. Lawrence River measure in the thousands. And um, 
it's a food source, absolutely food source. And it's a lot of fun and it's an economic driver, right? For tourism. But that's one side of the story. The other side of the story is what Save the River has been fighting for and so many others, which is the prevention of these other types of carp, the silver, the big head, the grass carp from getting into the Great Lakes and causing massive ecological change. You know, if we thought about the amount of change that took place on land and compare that with what's happening under the surface of the St. Lawrence River and the Great Lakes, if this, if it was the same, people would be absolutely astonished, absolutely astonished. You know, what's happening on land is it's not great in many cases. You know, we see changes. We've seen this over the years with acid rain and, and, and the hole and the ozone layer and, and things of that nature. And now it's climate change. But we haven't seen massive impacts to the terrestrial areas. You know, with these invasive species happening underwater, and as someone who does visual, like I said, I visualize this and I go down and I feel it. I go down with divers and I listen to them and we, we talk about what's down there and then read the report. And I try to visualize it in my mind, how things have changed so radically and keep changing and then change again and then change again. Entire, you know, species being replaced with other species and, and you know, apex predators being replaced with other predators like these these grass carps you know that are just going to just go in and mow down our weed beds or these big head and silver carp that are just going to chew up the base of the food chain and starve out all the native species massive massive genocide and we've got to stop this there's we can't underplay what's happening here with these other carp you know the common carp have adjusted they've settled in they play a role and I'm, I'm not saying they're completely benign they can cause destruction to weed beds there's no doubt about that these things are little you know earth eaters little rototillers down there when they're chewing and looking for grubs and stuff but there's um we, we, we haven't finished the job yet where there's there's things we have to pay attention to for sure all around invasive species uh, next slide please there's our little yellow perch, right? The famous yellow perch. Who doesn't like a good fish fry? Yellow perch. You know, people say, how do you cook your fish, Lawrence? How do you like to prepare your fish? And you know, they come up with all these recipes and dips and breadings and, you know, packing it with this herb and that herb and onions and lemon. Well, you know, butter, salt, perch done that's all you need to enjoy these little rascals so how are they doing right people are thinking well they're disappearing you know what's happening to our yellow perch what's happened to the weed beds where it's all going and i listened to some research being done on the saint lawrence river institute for environmental science and they're thinking maybe all these yellow perch and walleye that were so popular and so plentiful back in the 1970s and 80s maybe that was an anomaly Maybe what we're seeing now is the St. Lawrence River returning back to its original fundamental status. You know, after the glaciers melted and all the sediment washed through, you know, and the, uh, and the ice melted, what we had was very, a very pristine waterbed and very pristine lakes and very clear water that flowed through those systems. It, it, it wasn't until last century that we started pumping raw untreated sewage and agricultural products fertilizers washing off the land into the into the lakes and the river and all of that nutrients fueling massive massive weed bed growth that was never really meant to be there but if you had fertilizer you got nice rich soil under the seaway that you know was once farming soil where crops grew and now it's been flooded yeah add water nutrients sunlight you know, good soil, voila, weed growth. And with weed growth, you know, you get fish, huge, huge schools of fish. So no wonder we had these massive schools of yellow perch and walleye, and we were harvesting them by the white bucket load and selling them to restaurants and, 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 and all this trade and commerce taking place, all this commercial fishing activity. And now these weed beds are starting to shrink back because we've got a lot of this stuff under control, right? The sewage release situation is, is getting under control. <clears throat> what we're putting into our, our drains and wastewater, we're starting to get that under control for sure. I mean, it's not perfect yet, but the days of fertilizing the lakes, you can see this up the top end of the, uh, the Great Lakes, 
superior to a degree. I mean, that superior is vastly unchanged still, but it is the fastest growing. It's, would you believe this little offside here? Lake Superior is, is the lake in the world that's changing the fastest. No other lake in the world is changing as fast as Lake Superior. That's the top of the St. Lawrence. Then you've got Michigan and Hur Huron, and, and they've sort of reverted back to pre-industrial states, right? You know, you see the AOI population, smelt populations fading away, and, and these are very clear lakes. All that whole ecosystem that we created with invasive species is returning back to the way it was. Lake Erie is still full of nutrients, absolutely, and that's flooding into Lake Ontario, which is still quite quite productive in terms of nutrients and and fish and and bio load and all that with the with the alewife it's still there and that's all heading into the saint lawrence river but i think what's happening in superior and huron and michigan and all the work they're doing in lake erie to get the nutrients under control there that we the saint lawrence will become even clearer and cleaner again and and there'll be less weed growth still so we're, we haven't quite returned to pre-industrial levels yet but we're on the way so you know those yellow perch are going to become uh, maybe a meal we have once a year more of a ceremonial thing than something we snack on every weekend or just take it for granted N next slide please <clears throat> uh, Lawrence before we advance to the next slide there was yeah. a question that came in and okay. it's is the walleye resurgence <clears throat> natural or man-made by stocking the walleye a population also exploded with the uh, with the weed growth right and i'm going to get into this but let, well, i'll talk it right right now so then the walleye the weed growth fell back the walleye population fell back because the harvesting kept happening and then we were told not to eat the walleye but there was still some fishing activity so the walleye population started dropping back dropping back and then they discovered goby and, and, and now it's just funny smallmouth bass discovered goby eight ten years ago i mean they've been around for 20 years but it doesn't happen automatically these larger predator fish they don't switch over right away they're not that opportunistic or smart they're more habitual you know it's all about what their dna and uh, but the smallmouth bass found goby and started gobbling them up and and, and growing big and fat and plentiful and now the walleye have discovered them. And the walleye population in the St. Lawrence River is really strong. It's amazing. It, it's really doing well. It, it may not be, the numbers may not be the same as they were in the 70s and 80s when the weed beds were, were really solid, but they are there. There's no doubt about it. Thank you. Yeah. Fish health. So, you know, we, yeah here we go you know we got these pictures the fish health what's going on with the muskie you know we've got to manage the fisheries using science-based uh information that means investing in research doing the science we need to do to understand what's happening to the fish and as well collecting local knowledge indigenous knowledge and understanding too you know what's what do the fish mean to the people to the community to the economy you know not just looking at you know here's a fish and here's its breeding habits and this is where it spawns and this is what it eats and you know this is when it spawns and so on and so forth and their numbers you know that's all great information and science gives us this sort of very granular information but i was speaking with the um the executive director of the Ocean Tracking Network last Friday, and he's also the chairman of the Canadian River Institute. And he's saying that, you know, I, I was asking about students and, and attracting um, biologists to the university. And he said, Lawrence, we don't need just biologists. We need econ economists and sociologists and people that are that are studying indigenous uh, values and and indigenous people it's a collaborative effort if we're going to understand how the importance and how to ma manage these fisheries and the water effectively we need all hands on deck this is a collaborative effort if we're going to get the the big picture here the 360 picture you can't just do it by science alone and and, and it's not just indigenous and local knowledge and history it's all of it absolutely all of it is is vital because you know, we, we can quickly assess that there's a, a $200 million commercial fishery on the Great Lakes. And some people say it's the most valuable freshwater fishery in the world. But there's a 
billion dollar recreational fishery taking place on the Great Lakes. 7.8 billion Canadian dollars. I think that works out to about 25 American, but uh, no, I'm it's 7 billion. I rounded up to 8 billion Canadian, 7 billion American. That's, that's absolutely colossal in terms of economic uh, drivers. You know, but it's it's so hard to measure, and we're just getting our hands around that as we start to do these socioeconomic studies, right? We do these collaborative studies. We gather this information, you know, and we learn about the importance of fish for ceremonial, for food, and for trade. It's, you know, guiding hotels, motels, tackle sales, gas sales, boat sales, these direct uh, costs associated, uh, and expenditures that people are making to go fishing, you know, with guides and stay in resorts. And, and, and it, it, there's huge, huge economic drivers here. And we need to, when we're looking at water quality, we need to look at fish health. I, I, I deal with a lot of these water quality committees and, and environmental groups and conservation groups and water, water, water. And I'm saying, great, but you know what? You know, we know there's problems with waters and PFAS and mercury and metals and PS, you know, all sorts of chemicals that we need to be careful of. But are people dying when they drink a glass of water? You know, there's 40 million people that were drinking water on the Great Lakes. No one's dying. You know, yeah, it's not great. And there's things that we shouldn't be in there. We need to be careful about that. But there's also, that's that's what fish live in, right? The fish live in that. It, we need to, you can't look at water without looking at fish. And I think we're starting to get some headway on that. But I tell you, fish are not the cuddly polar bear, right? You know, or, or the... Um, the rhinoceros or the giraffe or you know some other sort of iconic species and i don't want fish to be you know let's save the fish and adopt a fish kind of thing you know they're they're our food source they're they're how we connect with nature I, i'm not suggesting that but i am suggesting that you we need to look at fish health as the big picture it needs to be part of that big discussion uh, next slide please so, you know, I listened to the presentation Wednesday night from your youth uh, training and engagement people, and I, I'm just blown away by the, the quality of the products that the Save the River is making and the investment of time and effort into reaching out youth, 12,000 youth trained and connected. You know, we're not talking a, a certificate here and walk away. What we're talking about is connecting young people to the river. And that's so vital. Some of the top psychiatrists in, in, in some of the best universities in the United States are saying that this is fundamental to development, that children have spent their lives at shorelines at very vital points, you know, at five, six, seven, eight years of age, gathering, uh, you know, polywogs and frogs and, and just looking at this synergy of life where land meets water. It's a, an explosion of life that fascinates children. It becomes their nat natural um, laboratory where they experiment, where they understand, you know, taking fish out of water and putting animals in water and what happens. And that whole interplay of one needing the other and how it all connects together. And giving kids that opportunity is so vital because it's how they make their connection and how they understand life. And there's people, psychiatrists who say that if you deny a child this experience, you deny them a fundamental process, a part of their development that will, you know, make their eventual development as an adult incomplete. Now we could try to catch up on that later in life, but we all know the power of, of bringing children to the water and introducing them to the fishing at a young age and how positive an impact it makes for them for the rest of their life, right? I mean, who here never had a fishing experience with their grandparents at a young age and then always thinks, you know, I'll go fishing again. That was, that's a beautiful moment. I can do that again anytime I know where my grandma or grandpa's fishing rod is, or I have a fishing rod in my closet. I, I'm going to go fishing again someday. It's just part of who I am. It's part of my childhood. And it's a, it's this powerful, powerful connection to nature that we can't undermine anymore. We need to, we need to make sure that happens and good for you guys for doing that. Um, Bluefish Canada, we, we're doing youth programs as well. We don't deliver them directly, but we love to support organizations like yours with, with great science-based uh, informational tools around fishing and youth uh, engagement. All about one more point here. You know, if you're going to harvest a fish, which one do you pick? Which species, what size, what time of year? You can harvest sustainably. And if you're going to let them go, 
how do you make sure they're going back healthy, right? Catch and release is fine, but you got to do it the right way. So these are the kinds of skills Bluefish Canada likes to focus on and share that information with organizations like yours to get into the minds and hands and experiences of children. Uh, next slide, please. You can imagine ice free winters year round shipping. Is that coming to the St. Lawrence? You know, we see more and more uh, the ice is is coming later and leaving earlier. Yeah, 2014 might have been a, 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 a tough winter with that polar vortex vortex there. And, you know, we had that deep freeze in 2014. But if you look at all the scientific data, and I was speaking with a scientist uh, just yesterday, and he was uh, he's studying just water temperatures and ice levels in the Great Lakes. He's uh, out of Duluth there. And, um, and he's saying, you know, definitely the water's warming up and the water's warming up on Lake Superior, he said even a two degree Celsius temperature uh, change, rise in the temperature of the Lake, Lake Superior means a, a massive difference in terms of how much ice is gonna form, like to the 30 to 40% shrinkage of ice level on the lake. So you have less ice, you have more open water all winter, more stronger winds, um, more storms, more storm damage. You know, we, we know climate changes mean more flood and, and, uh, and and heavy rain and and then we have you know we have to empty the river to try to get all that water out of lake ontario so you know the river dries up and the shores dry up and all those important wetlands dry up as we try to manage these floods so it, it, there's a lot going on here in terms of climate change and and um and and all that to say if we if the ice continues to disappear off the great lakes you're going to have ships going up and down the St. Lawrence River year round. What is that going to mean for the economy? What's that going to mean for the health of the of the river in terms of, you know, river uh, boats ping ponging and grounding and, and, and bumping up and down the river like they do in, in, in some of these incidents we've seen where of groundings and things like that? You know, it just takes one big colossal spill to turn this river upside down again. So I, I think this is this is something you want to put on your watch brief is is the uh, the ice flow and the industry push to get keep that river open longer and longer. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so here's here's a, a bass fishing tournament on the St. Lawrence River. And I've taken part in a few of these, you know, there's nothing that gets your blood going more than getting out there at, you know, 5, 30, 6 o'clock in the morning, waiting for the sun to come up, waiting for that start to happen. Everyone's milling about in their boats, trying not to bump into each other, you know, all the, all the talk and, 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 and psycho babble, trying to freak everybody out, and, you know, trying to get an advantage here and, and information sharing and everyone's, it's a, it's a lot of excitement. It's not only that though, it's economic drivers, right? This is another ecotourism opportunity. We talked about common carp. You know, these events come like Waddington, New York. When they have the Bassmaster tournament coming up there, you know, it's it's millions of dollars, millions of dollars of infusion of cash into that community, that small community. When you have, uh, you know, hundreds of tournament um, competitors coming and all the entourage and the hotels that they stay in and the pre-fishing and the tournament itself and the media attention. And then people see Waddington on the map it, all over the world and the great fishing and the, in these bass anglers saying best fishing ever, you know, and then other people are, man, I'm going, I'm going to the St. Lawrence river. It's goes on my bucket list and people are, it, it attracts the recreational weekend warriors and they start showing up because they want a piece of that action too. You cannot underestimate the value of bass fishing tournaments to your to the river this is something that needs to be embraced <clears throat> yeah there's challenges we had one bass fishing tournament organization uh, held a tournament there and just very close to clayton uh, on the saint lawrence river on the canadian side a few years ago and they had some colossal fish kills i think 195 large smallmouth bass were died before they could be released and uh and uh, I'm happy to say that that organizer was fined $10,000. It might not seem like a lot, but when it comes out of your own pocket, that's a pretty big ticket. And he was banned from fishing, holding an Ontario fishing license for quite a number of years. He's moved away since. And I know the gentleman, I know it's not something he intentionally did. And he had been running tournaments on the St. Lawrence River for years. And he had one bad day. 
one bad day. Well, actually it was two. You know, why he did it the second day, I don't know. But he did it two days in a row. And, uh, and he paid the price. He paid the price. So, you know, we have to watch that sort of thing. We have to make sure that when these tournaments do happen, that they do follow science-based best practices, things that work, you know, water weigh in. And the National Public, the National Professional Anglers Association just adopted a, 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 an app and they're endorsing this app for catch, photograph, report electronically and release. You don't even bring the fish back to the stage. You just upload pictures automatically. All the other competitors see who's catching what, when, how big. And all the fans are watching this live on their smartphones, seeing this action happen in real time through these videos. Of everyone's carrying on their on their boats and their phones now. You know, the, the interaction, the, the being there virtually in real time. It's happening. We, you know, we'll still have stages. We'll still have these gathering points and and celebrate the champions. But uh, the days of having to bring the fish back and bring them up on stage and show people evidence of what you caught, those days are. I think they're going to be fewer and farther in between as we start to switch over to this electronic reporting. You know, major league fishing. It's it's the new bass tournament series in the United States. Johnny Morris, the owner of Bass Pro Shops, Cabela's, he's promoted this. It, you know, thirteen bass tournament guys came up with the idea and johnny morris got on board and it's now the, one of the biggest bass fishing tournaments in the united states and it's just catch photograph release and how many fish can you catch and how many pounds of fish can you catch in one day and they all go back they all go back and you get penalties if you touch them to the shirt or you, you release them you splash them into the water there's all sorts of fines for not letting them go properly anyways all that's to say there's there's some great economy opportunities there for sure next slide please So here's a picture of Henry Lickers, Mohawk elder Henry Lickers. Uh, and he is the uh, one of the IJC commissioners on the Canadian side. You know, that IGC, I, I just, what great research they're doing. And, and, you know, everything, fish, water, fish, water, fish, water. I just love it. Absolutely love it. I'm interviewing their scientists all the, tape, all the time for my uh, Bluefish Radio podcast. And um, they're doing wonderful work. The IJC can't say enough good things about them. And, uh, and now that they've got the first ever indigenous person as a commissioner, this is the first, you know, this is a step in the right direction. Like I said, this is a collaborative effort and Henry's appointment as a commissioner shows the willingness to, to give a more collaborative effort. So it's not just scientists doing hard science here. This is really looking at all what we just talked about, the whole socioeconomic aspect of the Great Lakes and the St. Lawrence River. Next slide, please. So we talked about walleye and decline, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. But I will say that the, the consumption advisory issue around should you eat them or not? Are they toxic? Do they have too much mercury? And what about the other chemicals that we're finding in walleye now? What about the chemicals we're not even measuring yet? Some of these newer chemicals, these fire retardants and scotch guards and things like that. I, I don't mean to cite one company or another, but, but there's some pretty crazy chemicals going into the water and going into the fish. And it's totally impacting, you know, these Mohawk communities. It's impacting all of us. You know, it, it's it's impacting the, the health of the river, the whole ecosystem. I mean, these fish become toxic lollipops and then animals eat them and all that toxicity goes into the animals and then that's brought on land, eagles, birds, you know, all of that and, and people, all of that. So I think we really have some more work to do here, you know, not just areas of concern and the past damage that that's great work and we need to keep that up but there's now new threats and we need to get on top of that more work to be done to save the river you guys can't retire yet there's no way uh next slide please okay here's a here here's a, my picture with jeff at our muskie uh, john i think took the picture for us oh no i my, my cameraman took the picture and john was there uh, aboard the muskie uh, the muskie that's the name of the boat this beautiful 1958 
Chris Craft wooden boat, man. It's absolutely gorgeous. You know, I love the, I love boats. I love fishing. I love them both. Uh, but to touch this boat and to feel it and be on it. And uh, it was a beautiful day. And we recorded a podcast right there on the water. And uh, it was one of my favorite days for sure. Uh, this is another muskie I'm holding with a, a muskie guide, Lisa Goodyear, that was caught in St. Francis. And, um, and that was, that phone will stop ringing in a second. <laughs> Sorry. It, but there's, there's huge muskie. These are the apex predators of the St. Lawrence River. This is, this is the other canary in the coal mine. You know, they had a big fish kill. I think it was 2006, 2008, a lot of the big muskie died. And, and now they're, they're, it's happening again. It's happening again. And, and there's some good research. You've, you've had the scientists on. And, and John, thank you for putting me in touch with uh, the gentleman. And we've talked about, we've interviewed him on Bluefish Radio. And apparently the goby are harbingers of, of this virus. And the muskie are eating the goby. And if you eat so many of them, you're going to catch the virus. And, and so it's happening again. We're starting to see some decline in the muskie population again. So it's more important than ever that we practice good catch and release. Hey, it's, it's not like it was 100 years ago when we caught them, cut off their heads and nailed their heads onto a sheet of plywood and then, uh, and, and then celebrated the catch of the day. That, you know, thankfully those days are gone. But you know what, you can't, we can point fingers and we say bad people, bad people, but a hundred years ago, we didn't know you could wipe out a, a, a fish species with a hook and line. We didn't know. No one knew you could do that. We know now, and we've got the equipment to do it. We can find them. You know, these musky guides, they're putting on the side imaging radar on their boats now, and they can cruise slowly up and down the river and look sideways 100 feet, 200 feet out to each side and actually see the fish, see the fish with this new sonar. So is it fair? Well, I don't know. Is it effective? Absolutely effective. Does it imply a sense of stewardship and responsibility? Absolutely it does. Absolutely. You know, we need to know that these fish are going to be well taken care of, well handled. And uh, we, need, we need good science and we need expectations and moral leadership. It's not just about getting the equipment and using the equipment. It's using it responsibly. And we have to take more and more decisions about that, about being responsible as, as anglers and how we use this amazing equipment that's been put in our hands. The next slide, please. Oh, there's me going into the water in my scuba outfit. You know, I still haven't got my radio, two-way radio masks yet. And, uh, and the Handicap Scuba Association, they don't really go with those radio masks. Uh, they say they're too dangerous. You know, you look, take one of those off your face. You're, it's, it, you, you can't really clear them again, right? If you take that big glass mask off your head and, and it fills with water and you put it back on, you're not going to be able to clear it underwater. That's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a dangerous thing for sure. With a, with a regular mask, you know, one of the tests to get certified, you have to go down 100 feet, take the mask off, fill it with water and put it back on your face and then clear the mask. Now, my big question as a blind person is, why do I need a mask? <laughs> <laughs> and I, I argued with the instructor for a while on that one until he brought me down for one of my first dives in a quarry. And we were down there, I think 80 feet. And he said, okay, take your mask off, Lawrence. And I took it off and all that cold water hit my face. And I almost like, like went, oh my God. You know, it was like getting hit in the bucket with a, hit in the face with a bucket of ice water. Absolutely. And I couldn't get that mask back on my face fast enough. But um, all that to say, you know, uh, the scoop is another opportunity for tourism. There's no doubt about it. People love going onto the St. Lawrence River and, and doing scuba. And uh, that's not going to change. There's beautiful wrecks down there. There's fish. There's ecology. There's history. There's villages down there. You know, there's so much. And that really needs to be better documented and more tourism opportunities developed around that. Uh, you know, I think there's, there's a lot of opportunity there that we're not we're not taking advantage of an opportunity to connect big children, you know, grown adults to nature through scuba, through underwater. And I, I'm thinking, man, uh, when are we going to get the little submarines? So, you know, people who don't do scuba can get into a little submarine and, and tour the St. Lawrence river. There, there's your challenge. Uh, St. Um, save the river, get a little yellow sub and get us down there. You know, that, that would be amazing. What an amazing way to introduce people to the river. Uh, next slide, please. So 
here's me with a northern pike and the you know we know the pike are also in trouble right you know we used to be able to catch them by crazy in the saint lawrence river what happened it's the coastal it's the shorelines it's the wetlands you know we're not respecting those wetlands like we should and you know plan 2014 was the solution right we we're supposed to let the flooding happen in the spring a little more a little longer so the wetlands could stay wet so when the pike go in there and spawn and lay their eggs and spawn sorry i had it in the wrong order but uh that the it doesn't go high and dry two weeks later when the river returns to what we consider to be acceptable you know we have this very narrow band of acceptability in terms of where the river level should be and we've trained property owners to accept that as the norm that's not the norm that's just convenience that we've we've tricked people into believing is the new norm the norm is wetlands and we don't have coastal wetlands along the shores of the st lawrence river we're not going to have pike and we're not going to have so many other species that make this river the attraction that it is you know no one wants to have a cottage or a home along a ditch a ditch that just conveys ships and water and other things up and down. We want the nature. We want the beauty of the river. I think we all want that. And that means looking after the wetlands because without that, you've just ripped the heart out of the river. We can't do that anymore. We have to, we have to push back on those plan 2014 um, people who want that changed you know we have to find some sort of compromise so that those wetlands can stay wet so that these northern pike can spawn you know the, another canary here another apex predator and all the other life there's so much other life that happens in these wetlands that needs to be safeguarded and we need to get those wetlands back we've lost 80 percent of them folks 80 percent have been disappeared hardened developed you name it what's that invasive species taking them over cattails you know all sorts of issues we need to get them back next slide please oh thank you oh here we are at the end 